everyone, and welcome to TMA's Myositis Research Insights webinar. I am your host today. I am Rachel Bromley, TMA Senior Manager of Patient Education, Support, and Advocacy. And today I am so excited to have with us Dr. Nicole Foot, um, who is a um, one moment. I just started so strong, and then I lost my biography. There it is. Uh, Dr. Food is a rehabilitation physician and postdoctoral researcher at Radboud University in the Netherlands. Her research focuses on implementing evidence-based rehabilitation interventions and measuring and treating muscle fatigue and neuromuscular diseases. She is also a member of the TMA Medical Advisory Board. Welcome, doctor. How are you? Thank you, Rachel. And I'm very- We can't I'm hear you. And happy to be here. Um, oh, it's, hold it's on. It's evening now, Can you hear me? Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me now? I can. Uh, very nice. It's uh, the evening now in the Netherlands and I'm happy to um, to present to you more about fatigue and exercise in uh, in myositis. Um, and today it's cold in the Netherlands, and I don't know um, if you are all in the USA and how is the weather there, but um, many patients <laughs> don't like the cold weather. It's Do you also have snow? not very helpful for myositis. Sorry? Do you have snow? Uh, no, not snow today, but we did yeah, have we don't last week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So before you get started on your work, can you tell us a little bit about how you uh, picked myositis as you know your field of research to begin with? Uh, I can tell you more about it. Um, I did my PhD in another uh, neuromuscular disease, FSHD. It's a slowly progressive muscular dystrophy. Uh, but I work in the Netherlands. Um, in the Netherlands, um, with patients um, in the Rappard University Medical Center. Uh, it's an academic medical center and also in the rehabilitation center, uh, rehabilitation center Klimendal in Arnhem, the Netherlands. And the Rappard University Medical Center is also an expert center for uh, myositis. Um, so therefore my research and my clinical work is in FSHD, myotonic dystrophy, but also in myositis. Uh, and because of that, I came into contact also because of Ingrid de Groot. She's a very famous patient representative in myositis. Uh, and I do a lot of patient projects together with her. I came into contact with the Myositis Association. And I'm also in the medical research board. And I lost Rachel, but I didn't lost you uh, as listeners of this uh, webinar. So I will start my uh, presentation. And therefore, I will share my screen. Um, let's see. It's over here. Ah, there you are again, Rachel. Can you see my uh, my screen? Yeah, okay. So uh, in the next hour, I will talk about fatigue and exercise in myositis, uh, about research, but there's also space for questions. So if there are any questions, put them in the Q&A and Rachel will help um, asking the questions to me. So I hope it will be interactive. Uh, here are some images. Um, I will show you what I'm going to talk about. Um, as you can see, I will show you, uh, I will talk about my holidays. I will um, tell you how you can solve a Rubik's cube. We're going to talk about dogs um, and seeing some comics, uh, but no kidding. Um, this is about the content of the presentation. Because, first of all, fatigue is a multidimensional problem, just like a Rubik's Cube. And it's a very complex problem. And here's someone who has written a definition on fatigue. Uh, he's tried to write a definition in only one sentence. Um, but please don't remember it, don't even read it. Um, but it's just to show you how complex fatigue is. And there are many factors associated with fatigue, causes as well as consequences. So don't read it. But there is an important distinction between on the one hand acute fatigue and on the other hand chronic fatigue. And that's important because acute fatigue 
it's not a very big problem. But there is one um, thing you have to take into account. Acute fatigue is no problem uh, unless it's there every day. But acute fatigue is a more or less a positive fatigue. It occurs after energy expenditure, for example, after a competition. It is of short duration and it improves with rest. But chronic fatigue, on the other hand, it's about early exhaustion. It's a more severe form of fatigue. And when you experience chronic fatigue, you have an aversion to effort. And there is no direct relation to physical effort. So if you want to know, is my fatigue acute fatigue or chronic fatigue? There is one important question. And I will ask my patient, your fatigue, can you, um, can you correlate it with the things you do? For example, um, when you have a busy day, then your fatigue is more. And when you have a quiet day, then you have no fatigue. But many patients say to me, my fatigue isn't directly related to the things I do. Then there's a great risk that you experience chronic fatigue. You cannot predict it. And it's not typically ameliorated by rest. So that's not positive. Um, even if you rest, the fatigue is there. Uh, and it's a multidimensional concept. There are many factors associated with chronic fatigue. And why is acute fatigue also important? Because when you are acute, when you experience acute fatigue very frequently, it can become chronic fatigue, especially when you don't take enough rest. And that you can you can see that here in in this graph. Uh, the blue one is okay. The blue one is you are active, uh, so you are a bit fatigued, but then, and the active the, the activities are the, the gray block, but when you take enough rest, you rest and you're not fatigued anymore, and then the next day you are busy, you are fatigued, you take a rest, and the fatigue is away. But the problem is when you have activities and your rest is too limited, then you build up the level of fatigue. There's an accumulation of fatigue and that can lead to chronic fatigue. You are at risk for chronic fatigue. And it's very important to prevent chronic fatigue because as I said before, acute fatigue can go away, but chronic fatigue can be there every day. And it's very difficult, more difficult to cope with. So rest is just as important as activity. Um, and with myositis, you have a low fatigability resistance, or in other words, when you do the same thing as your, your healthy neighbor, there is a greater risk that you um, uh, get chronic fatigue because you have a myositis. So there's a greater risk for chronic fatigue. And there are three important P's when talking about fatigue, three factors. First of all, the precipitating factors, uh, once chronic fatigue is there because of uh, an illness, a surgery, a trauma, uh, but you can do, you cannot do anything about the past. So you cannot do anything about precipitating factors. Then you have predisposing factors, or in other words, um, you have a higher risk of getting chronic fatigue. And myositis, for example, is a predisposing factor. But up till now, unfortunately, we cannot do anything about myositis. And the last factor is the most important. And these are the perpetuating factors. Because perpetuating factors make that the acute fatigue becomes chronic fatigue and that chronic fatigue doesn't go away. So these are also um, very important for, for example, rehabilitation programs because we can do uh, something about perpetuating factors. And of course, you're very curious, what are perpetuating factors? In the Rappaut University Medical Center, we performed research on perpetuating factors of fatigue in different uh, types of neuromuscular diseases. And it appeared that muscle weakness, that's in the left upper corner, was only an indirect factor because muscle weakness doesn't lead directly to fatigue. So in other words, if your weakness is more severe, um, then it doesn't mean that you have a high level of fatigue. It's more or less the other way around. I see many patients with a limited level of muscle weakness, but because they still have a full-time job and they have to take care for the family, they have a high level of fatigue. But muscle weakness can lead to physical inactivity. And physical inactivity is the most important factor leading to fatigue. 
Or in other words, physical inactivity is a high risk factor for chronic fatigue. The second most important factor is pain. Pain can also lead to fatigue. And the third most important factor is sleep disturbances. And why is fatigue so important? That's because fatigue can lead to a lower level of social participation, um, that you have difficulties uh, performing your job activities, for example. Um, as I said before, this model, it's a model of perpetuating factors, applies for different types of neuromuscular diseases. But um, in the past, it was developed for chronic fatigue syndrome. And the same model applies, for example, for fatigue after cancer, for multiple sclerosis, for Parkinson's. So researchers in the Amsterdam University Medical Center, they asked themselves, is fatigue a disease specific or a more generic symptom in chronic medical conditions? And the answer is that it isn't disease specific. Only in 10% fatigue is disease specific and in 90% it's a more or less generic symptom. So physical inactivity, pain, sleep disturbances are common in all different types of diseases. And therefore, rehabilitation interventions can be applied to all these different types of diseases. Um, when I see someone with fatigue in my consulting room, it's very important to know, is fatigue a primary consequence of myositis or a secondary consequence? When it's a primary consequence, it's very difficult to treat. But the primary consequence, it's, it's more or less more for diseases like, for example, mitochondrial diseases, myasthenia gravis. In myositis, most of the times it's a secondary problem. And secondary problems are indirectly related and are very more um, applicable to rehabilitation interventions than primary problems. These are very more difficult to treat. But it's not only the most important thing. It's also important to know the what we call as physicians a differential diagnosis or are there other factors that can, can lead to fatigue. Uh, for example, a kidney disease, sleep disorder, medication, a beta blocker medication. That's what the cardiologists prescribe. Um, causes a lowering of your heart rate and um, is also prescribed for cardiac problems. But it's important to know that beta blockers have an important side effect, and that's fatigue. And with beta blockers, it's more difficult to, for example, exercise. And sometimes it is needed to prescribe beta blockers. But sometimes, for example, when you have hypertension, there are also other medication um, that can lower um, uh, your blood pressure, but do not have the side effect of fatigue. So when you have a beta blocker, I advise you to ask your physician, is this beta blocker needed or is there an alternative when you experience fatigue? Because it's such an important side effect of a beta blocker. And painkillers, um, morphine, for example, are also, um, they can also cause uh, fatigue. Some examples uh, written in this slide. Then, um, how can we measure fatigue? And I showed you the definition. There are many factors related to fatigue. So it's, it's very difficult to measure. Um, and we can do a little quiz. Um, think about it. How many questionnaires do you think on fatigue exist in a general literature? Uh, 10, 50, 100 or more? I will give you the answer. There are 250 questionnaires on fatigue, and that's already in 2007, and we are now in 2023, so I think there are 500, but that's not the most striking thing. Um, that's 150 of these questionnaires have been only used once, or in other words, every researcher has his own questionnaire for fatigue. And why does every researcher has his own questionnaire for fatigue? And that's because it's very difficult to measure. It's a subjective symptom. And you can imagine that a questionnaire, something you, you write down, it's very difficult to measure a subjective symptom. So therefore, we try to measure it more objectively. And there is experience or subjective fatigue on the one hand, but on the other hand, you have muscle fatigue. 
when you have myositis, you experience muscle fatigue in your muscles. And therefore, it's difficult to be active. Um, and in the Rappaut University Medical Center, we measure muscle fatigue also in patients with myositis. Because um, what we did is we performed EMG measurements. And EMG, um, it stands for electromyography. Uh, it measures the signal what goes from your brain to your spinal cord, through your nerves, and then to your muscles. So it's a kind of a signal to your muscles. And in these EMG signals, the amplitude, you can measure thresholds. Or in other words, the amplitude increases a lot, and that's a kind of a threshold. What we did was we performed cycling measurements in patients with neuromuscular diseases, cycling measurements, maximal cycling measurements, and we measured with ergospirometry. Um, ergospirometry, then you measure um, the breathing of a patient, and in the breathing, you measure carbon dioxide uh, and also oxygen, and you can also measure a kind of a thresholds in this signal. And there are two thresholds, an aerobic threshold and an anaerobic threshold. And what does this threshold mean? The aerobic threshold means that there is lactate. Lactate comes, it's a, it's a waste product, product from your muscles, and lactate builds up when you're active. And that's the aerobic threshold. Lactate builds up. Your muscles are becoming a bit fatigued. And the anaerobic threshold, that's when lactate builds up so high that you cannot breathe it out because you breathe uh, lactate out through carbon dioxide. And that's the anaerobic threshold. And in healthy subjects, it appeared that in the EMG, we can also measure two thresholds. And these were at the same time at the aerobic threshold and the anaerobic threshold. And I thought, because in myositis, uh, one muscle is weak, the other muscle is more strong, there is a difference in muscle fatigue as measured with EMG. And it appeared that I was right. There is also a difference, not only between muscles, but also between myositis patients and patients without myositis. Because in myositis, we saw that the thresholds in EMG, the muscle fatigue, appeared at an earlier moment in time than the fatigue as measured in the carbon dioxide from your whole body, from your breathing. So muscle fatigue appears early in time. But there's a problem because exercise programs for myositis are based on exercise programs for healthy people, so for other thresholds. And there's a high risk of overuse because with these, um, uh, these guidelines, there is a great risk that you are exercising already ahead of these muscle fatigue thresholds. So that your muscles are fatigued um, very frequently and very high and very severe. So what we did in Nijmegen during exercise, we advised our patients not to start at 50% of the maximum, these are the healthy person's guidelines, but to start at, for example, 30% of the maximum. So below uh, the first threshold for muscle fatigue. And there were several patients who were not able to build up the level of exercise. And they were now able to build up the level of exercise without any side effects. And there's, for example, a patient of mine who is now able um, to go by bike uh, to pick up her daughter from school and uh, was able to bike with her uh, partner again. So very effective. And therefore, I now always say, when you start exercising, it's better to start low and go slow. Because when you start low, you are um, not passing your muscle fatigue threshold. And of course, you can build up very slowly until you are at your muscle fatigue threshold. And we hope that with these new exercise guidelines, we are able to build up also the thresholds. Because why it's so important? Because you have to deal with muscle fatigue in daily life too. Um, and that keeps you from your household activities, from your job. And when you are able to build up the level that you experience muscle fatigue, you are able to perform more physical activities with less fatigue. So I hope in the future I can tell you more about the effect. That's EMG, but there is another way to measure muscle fatigue, and that's with kinematics. And that's all about coordination of movement. 
you can see here at the left athletes and they have a perfect coordination, more or less the same. At the right hand side, you can see two athletes, two triathletes, two brothers. And I think all of you can see which brother experienced the most fatigue. It's the right brother. You can see it in his face. You can see it uh, in the way he moves. And that's about coordination. And we can measure fatigue also um, with means of coordination and how people move. And what brought me to the idea, that was one of my patients. She has an assistant dog. And um, her assistant's dog helped her measuring her fatigue. Because before she get the assistant dog, she, she couldn't measure her, her muscle fatigue. And as a consequence, um, there was overuse, a lot of overuse in daily life. Uh, up till such a level um, that she fainted. Uh, but her dog, when she had a dog, he helped her. When he experienced that she was fatigued, he was sitting in front of her and he barked. And then she knew, ah, I am fatigued and I have to take a little rest. And then she goes ahead. And when since she has her dog, she never fainted, never again. And I saw her during the COVID period and during the COVID period, everyone wore, wore, wore a mask and the dog wasn't happy with the mask. He was always putting the mask from her face. And my patient said to me, I think that that's, it's about my smell. He, he smells that I'm fatigued, but I say, no, I think he's seeing it in your face, just like the right brother. He sees in your face that you're fatigued. That, that's my hypothesis. So what we are now, our current project is on muscle fatigue, again, measuring during cycling measurements, during strength measurements, um, with the breathing, with the lactate, but also with EMG and also motion analysis. Maybe some of you know, know of motion analysis because it's applied frequently in rehabilitation medicine during gait analysis. You can see at the right-hand side a figure, uh, it's built up. Um, with motion analysis um, and you have little little balls on your joints uh, and cameras measure the position of the balls and with that the position of your joints and your movement. So we are now measuring fatigue with EMG, muscle fatigue, but also in coordination. And what we saw was a difference in timing. When, when do we detect fatigue? We detect first fatigue in the motion. So first, there's a difference in movement, just like the right brother. Then we saw the lactate. We, we measured it in the breathing, the carbon dioxide, and after that, in the muscles with EMG muscle fatigue. So when we want to prevent muscle fatigue, when we want to help, when I want to help my patients decreasing the muscle fatigue in daily life, the motion analysis is the most promising thing. And I'm very happy to tell you that maybe the, the step to mo measure motion in daily life is not a big step because there are now already cameras um, and also apps uh, in smartphones who can measure motion and, and perform motion analysis. There was a research in Italy um, in um, patients with neuromuscular diseases and they were able to measure the motion in daily life. So I hope um, that we can uh, implement this technique, technique very quickly in daily life. And why it's important when you are able to be your own assistance dog, to measure your own fatigue, you are able daily life, real time, it's very more easy to cope with muscle fatigue because then you, you know you have to take a rest, take a small rest, and then you can go ahead. Because uh, what's happening now most of the time, you don't measure your fatigue. You know the day after that you were fatigued the day before, but then it's too late. And then there's a great risk of building up fatigue and that acute fatigue becomes chronic fatigue. There's another important thing because what we learned with our research was the, the important um, factor of compensation mechanisms. What is compensation mechanisms? One muscle becomes fatigued and our muscles are very friendly for each other. When one muscle becomes fatigued, the other muscle helps the fatigued muscles. For example, when you're 
the dorsal flexor, the flexor of your foot becomes fatigued, there is a risk of tripping. And then another muscle in your upper leg helps. It helps by lifting your leg so you don't trip anymore. But the other muscle has also other tasks. And he is not, um, yeah, it, it's not his primary task to, to lift up a leg during walking. And then there is a great risk of not only fatigue in the upper leg muscle, but also pain, pain due to overuse. And many patients, a, a famous muscle that is always helping other muscles is the muscle at your side. Um, I, I can predict that many of you experience pain um, at, in the hip region, at the side of your upper leg, because that's a very helpful muscle. He always helps other muscles, but that's the muscle uh, who experience a lot, a lot of time uh, pain. So why is motion analysis so important? Because then um, we know more about compensation mechanisms. We see what is the primary muscle which gets fatigue, what is the helping muscle, and we have to help the helping muscle um, by, for example, strengthening exercises, uh, build up the strength of the helping muscle, because the helping muscle is most of the time the muscle who is not, uh, who doesn't experience muscle weakness because of myositis. It's a more or less a strong muscle. Think about uh, uh, your work. There are colleagues who are strong and who are always helping other colleagues, but they are at great risk of getting a burnout because they always help other people just like in your your body there are muscles who are not weakened but they help other muscles and with that there's a great risk of pain and overuse so when we know which muscles are the helping muscles which muscles are the primary fatigue muscles we know that we have to help the weakened muscles uh, with additional for example um, aids for walking or thosis uh, or a crutch and the other helping muscles, we have to build up muscle strength of the helping muscles. And with that, we can prevent pain because we now can cure pain or cure fatigue. Uh, apologies, we can cure fatigue with rehabilitation interventions, but pain, when there is chronic pain, it's, it's more difficult to treat pain. So in case of pain, it's important to prevent pain. So that, let me turn to the treatment of fatigue. Fatigue is a multidimensional problem, but there are also multidimensional solutions. Here are my holiday pictures. And why do I show you these pictures? Um, at the left side, you can see a valley in the mountains, or in other words, a very high valley, and there are mountains, but not very high relatively. On the right-hand side, you can see um, that there was once an idea to build up a mountain in the Netherlands from $7 trillion. Um, great idea, not. <laughs> but as a patient with myositis, you want a valley in a mountain, or in other words, you want a high capacity to do things in daily life um, and, and low peaks. What you not want is a valley or is a mountain in the Netherlands, or in other words, a low level, a low capacity, a very high demands in daily life, because that's a great risk of chronic fatigue. And how can you get there? You can get there to have structure in daily life, strict bed and wake times, for example, um, every day doing the same things every day. But now we have a problem because um, in the modern world, um, the, from Monday to Friday, we also have very busy days and the weekend it's more relaxed and we have other bed wake times. But the best thing is to do more or less the same every day. Other important thing is to listen to your body. There was once a girl of six years old and she said, pain and fatigue, that's when your body talks to you. So she's very smart because she is right. When you experience pain, when you experience fatigue, your body is saying something to you. Watch out. Um, you are already ahead of your fatigue threshold. Um, but one important thing to know it's only the case for acute fatigue, because remember what I said in the beginning, in chronic fatigue, there's no relation anymore between what you experience and what you're doing. So then you don't have to listen to your body. In chronic fatigue, you have to build up a structured life. But in acute fatigue, it's very important to listen to your body because he's talking to you just like the dog. 
Another important thing is that life is not a competition. What are competition? Competitions are mountains. Sometimes you are going on a day off with your family and that's a very, very fatiguing day. Uh, it costs a lot of energy, but that's okay. It's okay uh, when it's once a month, for example. But when you are uh, going a day off every day, then yeah, I can uh, predict that you are building up chronic fatigue because there are too many mountains. And of course, sometimes you have to do a competition. Athletes do competition, but they don't do competition every day. In the Tour de France, they do. But after the Tour de France, they take a rest. Very important. And when you have a day off, you can ignore your pain and fatigue. Okay, that's okay. But don't ignore your pain and fatigue during your exercises, during your training days. Then you have to listen. And why it's important to not ignore your pain and fatigue, you can see a graph here uh, from a research in healthy cyclists. And there were two groups, three groups of cyclists. Um, and you can see the, the in um, the y-axis, the vertical axis, the power, or in other words, the intensity of the cycling exercises. So the higher the intense, the more intense the cycling exercises. On the x-axis, the horizontal axis, you can see the distance. It was a competition. They have to cycle five kilometers. And there are three groups. You can see, uh, first of all, the fentanyl group. Fentanyl is a very strong painkiller. And these are the triangles. Um, and you can see that in the beginning, up to one kilometer, they are doing very well up to 400 uh, watts of power. Um, but then in the end, they are doing not very well anymore. They have less power. So when you ignore your pain, in the beginning you are able to um, give more power, but in the end, your power decreases. So in the end, you get the receipt of ignoring your pain. Then the control group. Uh, the control group is the group who doesn't receive any medication. It's doing very stable and in the end it's a sprint. And very uh, interestingly, there is a placebo group. And placebo means they are getting medication um, and they don't know if it's medication or not, placebo. And they are more or less um, the same as the control group, but a little bit of more power in the beginning because they think, oh, I have fentanyl, I don't experience any pain. But with no side effects, with no drop of power in the end. What I want to say with this third group is the power of your mind, because when you think you are in control of your pain, that's very helpful. And therefore, education, like I do now, this webinar is very important, because when you understand your pain, you understand why you experience pain, why you experience fatigue, what you can do about it, that's a very powerful drug. Now, even placebo, it, it is very effective. It's a drug, it's medication. Education is medication. Then um, there are different phases of the disease, also in myositis. And I always educate my patients on the different phases. And these different phases um, uh, can apply to walking, uh, to moving your arm, to different muscles. First, there's the green phase, the exercise or improvement phase. What does that mean? In, in this phase, you are able to improve. Uh, for example, by training, uh, you are able to build up muscle strength. Um, for example, in the healthy muscles who are not weakened by the myositis. Then, when that's not possible anymore, um, it's the aim to stabilize, to stay at the same level of strength or the same level of activities or the same level of walking distance. And then it's very important to compensate. Um, that other muscles are going to help or you'll compensate with walking aids so that you're still doing the same things. Um, and when that's not possible anymore, it's the acceptance phase. And it's very important that the physician and the patient know in which phase am I and what are the most helpful uh, interventions in that phase. But most of the time when you're asking for help, um, patients are already in the red phase. And why is that the case? When a muscle becomes weakened, uh, first you don't experience anything. Um, when a cyclist of the Tour de France um, um, is weakened, he's still able to cycle. 
But when a muscle gets gets weakened, 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 then other muscles are going to help, and then you're still able to perform your daily life activities, and you notice you don't notice anything. But there is already changing something, and I'm sure, I'm for sure that when I apply motion analysis. Um, I see already the compensations. And why do you see compensations? Because people move in another way. But you don't experience anything because you can still walk, you can still do your things. But I hope as a rehabilitation physician that I can detect this phase and that I can see you in the compensating phase to prevent pain and to prevent fatigue. Therefore, it's very important to see people in time. Because when we are already here, we are here when the compensating muscles are not able to help anymore, when they are going to fail. And where, when you experience chronic fatigue, chronic pain, it's very difficult to help people in the red phase. And sometimes you are already in the accepting phase that you cannot do any better. So I hope that also with the motion analysis, we can help people detect the problems early in time. And what I want uh, uh, to, to learn you is the, the very uh, important use of, uh, for example, arm support, walking aids, orthosis, smartwatches. When using walking aids, people uh, are afraid that their muscles become lazy. But when you use walking aids in the correct phase, in the compensating phase, the yellow phase, and you help your body, you help the compensating muscles, you prevent pain, you prevent fatigue. And for example, with an orthosis or with um, special shoes, you are able to still walk the same distance without the risk of overuse. When you use walking aids in the correct phase, in the correct way, you don't become lazy. Um, in other words, for example, a cyclist in the Tour de France, he has the same, he has the, a very expensive, lightweighted um, bicycle. It's a kind of a cycling aid. But is he lazy? No, he's not lazy, but he can cycle at a very high power level, a very uh, high speed. So the, the very expensive bicycles, these are your walking aids. Your walking aids help you do the activities of daily life without pain and without fatigue. And because of your higher um, activity level, you also prevent that the aerobic capacity uh, lowers as a consequence. When you are still able to do your walking activities, uh, you are going. To, you are still able to go to the supermarket because of your walking aids. Um, your heart and your lungs still are still healthy. So very important. You are not going to be lazy uh, because of support. Because what they do is that they lower the fatigability and with that you can do more activity. They, there's an, another activity limit. Because when you have myositis, your capacity is less and you have a lower capacity. And most of the time you have to do the same thing as healthy people. You have to do the same uh, activities of daily life, household activities, going to your job, caring for your family. And I've told you about the ventilatory thresholds, the lactate, the carbon dioxide in the breathing. It's all about your capacity. And normally in healthy people, you are doing your daily life activities in the lowest phase, below your threshold, no problem. You can do it for hours. But when you have myositis, you are performing daily life activities ahead of your threshold, ahead of the anaerobic threshold. You have a very high level of lactate very high level of muscle fatigue. So you are a top sporter of daily life because what are daily life activities for you is a Tour de France uh, for cyclists, a very high level. And what we want to achieve with rehabilitation medicine is to change um, the thresholds, to change the thresholds and to not make you a top sporter anymore in daily life but someone who can perform his daily life activities below the fatigue threshold. And how can we do that? We can do that by, for example, exercise. And an exercise, um, it's not like one exercise. It's very, there are different aspects of exercise. And I will tell you some terminology. First of all, overload. 
when you want to, to build up strength, when you want to build up aerobic capacity, there has to be something additional. You can see uh, an escalator to the fitness room. Um, and sometimes uh, people, healthy people, um, go by car to the fitness room in the Netherlands. Uh, but why not go by bike to the fitness room? And for example, when you want to exercise, that's okay. But when you, uh, for example, uh, don't do your daily life walking activities anymore to go to exercise, that's no good. That's no overload. There has to be something additional to it. But there's one um, very important thing to know about overload in myositis, because sometimes exercise causes overload. When I have a patient who is already very busy in daily life, with all the different daily life activities, with the job, sometimes I say it's no good to perform exercises now because it only leads to overuse. First of all, we have to take a look at the daily life activities and how we can spare energy and how we can apply more rest during the day to, to build up space for exercise in order to prevent overuse. So overload. Then the other thing is specificity. You can see here a rugby team who is maybe having a day off because uh, performing ballet is not very specific for a rugby team. What is specificity? Uh, in other words, what you train is what you get. Um, when you want to play uh, rugby at a very high level, um, these rugby players will exercise rugby every day. And uh, for example, the cyclists will perform cycling exercises and sometimes maybe running exercises, but most of the time cycling exercises. So it's very important to know what's the aim of exercise. What do you want to achieve with exercise and then choose the right exercise. But also another different thing for myositis because when you want to, um, perform walking better, um, then walking is not always the best activity to do because walking can be very difficult and can lead to overuse, to tripping, to falling, especially when your leg muscles are weakened. Then sometimes it's better to perform, for example, cycling exercises on an ergometer and with that build up muscle strength instead of uh, performing walking exercises because walking exercises don't build up aerobic exercise at a very high level, because cycling is more uh, fatiguing for your heart and your lungs than walking, and there's a great risk of falling and tripping. And many um, of my patients are afraid that when they uh, don't walk an hour every day, they lose walking, but it's the other way around. When you perform walking at a too intense level or too much, there's a risk of uh, overuse of muscle fatigue, of muscle pain, of falling, of tripping, and with that, you lose your walking abilities. So when you want to improve your walking, it's not always the best thing to do to exercise walking. And when you want to improve walking, think about the walking aids. They can also help you. Then the last thing is reversibility. You can see um, Maradona, for example, Mike Tyson, and you can see what's happening when they stop exercising. It's reversible. So exercise is something you have to do your whole day, uh, not your whole day, your whole life. Um, but when you have myositis, it can be progressive. So it's also important um, to sometimes change your exercise intensity when you experience that your muscle strength has been decreased. Because when you stay at the same exercise intensity, there's a risk of overuse because your muscles are more weakened. So when you experience any uh, difference, please visit your physical therapist uh, or your physician um, to revise your exercise. And when you want to start exercises, how? Um, think about what I said before, start low and go slow. Better to start at 30% and build up slowly than to start at 50% of your maximum. And there's another important aspect, because when you are able to build up, when you are able to go from 30 to 31 to 32, um, it's better for your self-esteem. Because the other way around, when you start at 50% and it's not possible and you go to 
40%, your brains are thinking that's no good. Exercise is no good for me. Exercise causes muscle fatigue and your self-esteem decreases. Therefore, it's also better to build up very slowly. And it also decreases your fear of movement. So build up slow and start slow. And when it's possible, it's better to exercise, for example, uh, twice a week for 20 minutes uh, than every day 10 minutes. Now, why? Because when your aerobic exercise have a duration of 20 minutes, then it's better for your aerobic capacity than 10 minutes. It's just like a car. It's better to ride long distance than short distances. It's better for your muscles, uh, for your energy. And breaks are okay, but no longer than two minutes in between. The guideline is to exercise when possible, twice or three times a week. And when you're doing well, first shorten your breaks when you apply breaks, then increase the duration and then increase intensity. What I often see is that people, when they are doing very well, they increase the intensity. But first shorten the breaks, then increase the duration, and after that, increase the intensity. And how um, can you measure if you are at the right level? It's not very um, difficult. You can use the Borg scale. The Borg scale is, for example, a scale from 0 to 10. 10 is a very high intensity level, and 0 is no intensity level. And when you are about yeah, let's say three, four, five, you are okay. So you can measure, am I okay? Another uh, thing that you can measure is a talk test. When you are exercising and when you are still able to talk, you are not exercising at a too high level of intensity. That's, called, that we, that's what they call the talk test. Another thing is um, not longer than 24 hours of muscle strain, muscle pain, because when you experience uh, longer than 24 hours of muscle strain or pain, then um, there's a great risk of muscle pain and overuse. And when you exercise, try to exercise the major muscle groups which have the most muscle strength. For example, swimming is a very good exercise because you use your whole body. And the more muscles you use, the 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 more intense your heart and lungs have to work. So the more intense the aerobic exercise is. But when it, it's also important, what are your strong muscles? You have to exercise your strong muscles, your major muscles. Then let's turn to strength training. We know that aerobic exercise is very, very effective in myositis. There's a lot of research. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of research or strength training, not in myositis, not in any muscle disease. And I think it, it, it is possible and it can be applied safely. Um, but it, if you have to choose, if you have not a lot of time, choose aerobic exercise. But because we know that aerobic exercise is effective in decreasing fatigue um, and is also very helpful for your daily life activities. The effect of strength training is more limited, but when you have the time, it's possible. And when you apply strength training, again, focus on the muscles with relatively more muscle strength. And you can only exercise your muscles, um, which you can still move against gravity. When you are not able to lift up your arm anymore um, the, the whole distance, then don't exercise your arm because what's happening because when you want to exercise, um, for example, lifting your arm and it's not possible, you're going to use other muscles to make it possible. And again, helping muscles, risk of pain, risk of fatigue. And you can ask your physical therapist to measure your muscle strength, for example. Um, and in, um, in the uh, medical care, we give muscles a kind of a grade. Uh, um, from zero to five and five is maximal and zero is no muscle strength. And when your muscles have uh, the number three, they are able to move against gravity uh, and from three and better um, uh, the number four and five, they are still able to be exercised. It's called the MRC score, uh, the Medical Research Council score. 
And all of the physical therapists and physicians know of these score, these MRC score. So ask which muscles, uh, which of my muscles have a score of four or five, then you know that these muscles um, can still be exercised. And when you perform strength training, use a high number of repetitions and low weights. So not the other way around, high weights and a low number of repetitions, because again, great risk of overuse, but a high number of repetition and low weights also um, exercises the endurance of your muscles. And that's helpful for daily life activities. So for example, um, 20 repetitions with a weight. And sometimes a weight isn't even needed and you can, your, your body also have a kind of a weight. Your arm is a lot of kilos kilograms, pounds in the United States. So you can use your arm with no weights and it's also a lower risk of overuse. What you have to avoid is eccentric exercises. And how um, um, can you uh, detect eccentric exercises? For example, when I flex my elbow um, this way and when I want to to exercise my biceps, this is concentric. The biceps is getting smaller. And when I uh, extend my arm again and lower the weight, then the biceps is getting um, uh, longer. And that's eccentric because I have to, um, um, I have to help uh, the, the dumbbell, the weight, um, in order that it doesn't fall from my hand. And that's eccentric. And eccentric is a very um, helpful exercise for healthy people because with eccentric exercises, you can build up your muscle strength very quickly. But when you have a muscle disease, if you have myositis, there's a great risk that your muscles becomes damaged because um, what's happening, uh, your muscle is more or less getting a bit damaged. And then in healthy people, it's built up and it's getting strongly, but when you have myositis, you have um, it's more difficult to build up uh, muscles after eccentric exercise. So watch out because it can lead to a degree of muscle strength. And uh, for example, the Milan Circle, there are a kind of uh, fitness programs like the Milan Milan Circle, which uses eccentric exercises. And um, they often um, say, uh, be fit in 20 minutes, for example. And that's correct because eccentric exercises, with eccentric exercises, you build up your muscle strength very quickly. So you can build up in 20 minutes your muscle strength. But be careful with myositis because it can lead to a lower level of muscle strength. So when you're performing exercises uh, like this, ask your physical therapist, ask your coach, is there a component of an eccentric contraction in it? And when you have muscle weakness, be careful because it can lead to overuse. And then um, when you want to start exercise, um, choose um, the same day, the same time every week because Aristotle already said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Uh, what does he mean? You have to make exercise a habit, a habit in daily life, uh, in your week. So you know it's Monday afternoon, I'm going to exercise. Because when you start exercising, and when you, um, uh, and, um, in one week you choose the Monday, and the other week Tuesday, there's a risk that you are going to postpone your exercise sessions. So I will do it on Tuesday, I will do it on Wednesday. But when you choose uh, a day in the week, your body likes because it's a structure in the week uh, or ask someone to go with you and make it a habit, a habit in daily life. And I always say in every presentation that there are more than 600 different types of NMD and there are different types of myositis, but there are billions of people in the world and everyone is different. And some of these people have a neuromuscular disease, but that doesn't define their personality. And when looking at fatigue and when looking at pain and when looking at exercise, I want to see um, who is the person behind the disease. Because when I want to prescribe exercise, I want to know what's your daily life routine. Do you have a job? Uh, do you have a family? What do you like? Um, 
what was your favorite sport in the past? It's very important because one size fits nobody. Uh, and in um, the Rabba University Medical Center, um, we are performing now a multidimensional approach. Uh, and we are especially looking at the person behind the disease, because what I said before, one size fits nobody. And if you want to treat people equally, you have to do it in different ways, because um, maybe for, for the one person, it's aerobic exercise, for the other person, it's strength training. It's very important to know what's the aim, what's the goal, what do you like, um, what are the other things you do, and then prescribing exercise, and then seeing what can be the cause of fatigue, for example. Um, so to end, uh, it's very important when looking at fatigue, when looking at pain, to know what's lying behind fatigue, what's lying behind pain. Is there a risk of overuse? Uh, how is your daily life activities? How is your uh, a week um, and to give one example I, ha I had a patient and in the Netherlands it's always raining and cold and he said to me when I am on a holiday on vacation I'm doing very well so it's the hot temperature in Spain he went to Spain uh, but he had a smartwatch uh, and I said um, you have a smartwatch can I take a look at your activities when you're in the Netherlands and when you are in Spain and he showed me uh, his smartwatch, his activities. And then I said, hey, in the Netherlands, um, you have a very high mountain in the Netherlands. And when you're in Spain, you have a very uh, high valley um, in the mountains. Or in other words, in the Netherlands, he did a lot on Monday, uh, but on Tuesday, he was very fatigued. So he did less exercises, less activities. On Wednesday, he was um, not fatigued anymore and he did too much on Thursday fatigued, so the mountains. But in Spain, um, he was active every day. He goes to bed, uh, wake up at the same day, at the same time. Uh, his activity level was more or less stable during the week. So I said to him, okay, it can be that it's too hot temperature, but I think it's also in the difference between activities, your activity level, your bed and sleep times, maybe less mental stress um, uh, in Spain, that's also very important. Um, so take a look at all these factors that can play a role uh, in your pain and in your fatigue. Very important because it's a multidimensional problem and there's no one solution. So for every patient, every person, the solution is different. Um, don't play a competition every day um, so um, be sure that your capacity is as high as possible with no um, uh, highly demands in daily life. And yeah, take a look. Can, can you listen to your body? Can you feel your pain? Can you feel your fatigue? But the first question is, do you experience acute fatigue or do you experience chronic fatigue? Um, because then the treatment is, is different. So I hope... Um, I've given you some education, education as medication for fatigue, for pain, uh, some advices on exercise. And I saw uh, two questions. Um, so I hope I can answer your questions now. Let's see. Oh, we are already yes, please at seven. Go ahead. I'm here. You can stop uh, okay. sharing your screen yeah. and we'll uh, go over the questions. Um, yeah. In terms of exercise, you mentioned working out two to three times a week. Can I work out daily by rotating the muscle groups being worked? Yeah, that's uh, that's possible. Uh, you can rotate your uh, muscle groups, um, but be careful. Sometimes when you exercise one muscle, it can have an effect on the other muscle. For example, I'll give one example. I don't know the, the level of um, uh, muscle strength, but for example, when you uh, do your biceps, biceps curls, sometimes you also use your leg muscles um, to prevent that you uh, fall off the bench. And um, exercising one muscle can have an effect on the other. Um, but when you experience that your leg muscles are not fatigued, for example, after exercising your uh, upper arm muscles, it's okay to do arm uh, strengthening exercises on Monday and leg strengthening exercises on Tuesday. That's possible. Yeah. I hope I typically I do. You did. I typically do strength exercises every other day, but need to take a day off when I start to see a decline. 
If I take the day off, then when I come back, I notice improvement or better performance. So this is more of a comment than a question, but do you have anything yeah. to respond? Yeah, and that's called um, the super compensation. And that, that's very um, uh, helpful um, um, that's uh, being mentioned because uh, when you have exercised, you feel a little bit of fatigue, you feel a bit of muscle pain, and you don't feel very as well as you started your exercise. But that's okay. That it's a kind of a decrease of your capacity. And then there is rest, rest, sorry. And then you you in the rest period, therefore the rest is very important. You uh, build up your strength again, you build up your capacity. And when you're doing very well and your muscles are still able to, you are um, at a higher level than at the beginning. Uh, so what did person do is, is very good to do because it's not only about exercise. The rest is just as important as the exercises because in the rest you build up uh, your muscles again you build up your uh, endurance again so um, there's no training um, with rest and um, for example um, the cyclist of the tour de france who all um, who always wins the tour de france that's the person um, who has the best uh, resting capacity who has the best sleep quality because everyone is cycling every day, uh, but the person who is resting, um, who has a quality of rest or sleep uh, at the most high level, he is able um, uh, to win the competition. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise and knowledge with us. And yeah. we look forward to having you on another webinar um, sometime in 2024. We'll figure that out. But um, thank you to the audience for tuning in. This has been TMA's Myositis Research Inserts Insights webinar. And I am Rachel Bromley. Have a great day. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Bye.